going over this connection. So that gave them the idea, okay, well, if you can put multiple tones over here, uh, we, can, uh, we can actually transmit uh, signals, multiple signals, or audio. Uh, so that's where the idea of the, uh, uh, his idea of being able to actually do the telephone came from. So this is interesting, and this actually goes, we'll, we'll get back into the bandwidth issue in a second when we get to uh, some of the Maxwellians. But this was uh, late 19th century, or mid to late 19th century when this was happening. And at the same time, we're all studying this idea of electromagnetic waves. And there was a huge controversy, not huge, but there was a controversy in the scientific community about what electromagnetic waves were. And so one of the, the reason why this ties in, uh, Bell's work ties into this, is, and we've all experienced it, um, I'm sure I could generate it somehow here, um, but one of the things that, that had people thinking about uh, the creation of electromagnetic waves uh, and how we're actually gonna be able to demonstrate them comes from this concept here. This is the telephone switchboard. So hopefully a lot of uh, even the younger generation, uh, myself included, has seen this at least you know in videos or, or TV shows. Somebody actually plugging in into a switchboard to, cir to connect a circuit between two endpoints. Uh, when you do that, it's the same thing as if your speaker is on or your microphone is on and you plug it into a jack. You know, you get that awful noise, that, 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 that loud, like, crinkly noise that comes up. Uh, this was termed extra currents. All right, so they heard it and they, they, under they, they, they were dealing with it and, you know, you try to suppress that. But this thing happened, this extra currents happened. So trying to figure out why this happened is, the, is kind of the uh, part of the interesting uh, story of the invention or the, 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 the discovery of electromagnetic waves. Because what's happening? And this is what we're gonna f uh, study first in, uh, in our first GNU radio flow graph. So what's happening here is you're going from no signal to signal very quickly. So you have this not impulse, but impulse-like response to the, uh, to the system. So no signal to signal is a very sharp transition in time. So the first main lesson here, as far as from, a, from an educational perspective working with radio, is that short duration in time means long response in frequency. So we have these two properties uh, that are instrumental in how we, uh, we understand things. So, uh, and by the way, all, my, uh, all these flow graphs and, and examples and all this stuff are gonna go into, uh, onto my website so people can download them and, and play with them. They're all fairly simple, but this is what the introduction is for. So we're gonna start with this flow graph. This is what we, the, the term that we use in GNU Radio for basically a radio application. So we call it a flow graph uh, because data flows, and it, so it's a graph and data flows through it. Uh, it actually comes from the concept of process graphs, uh, kind of an old uh, CS uh, uh, theory. Um, but so yeah, so uh, every flow graph, and this is um, a thing called the GNU Radio Companion, and it's a graphical interface uh, 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 development interface environment for uh, working with GNU Radio. Uh, so you basically are able to graphically put down your blocks that make up your graph, your application, connect them together and run this. Now what this actually does is it builds a Python program and that Python program is what's actually getting executed. Um, and it actually executes C code. So there's like these three layers here. We have the graphical interface, the Python application itself, and then the underlying C++ library that is uh, GNU Radio. Uh, so if I go to the canvas now, switch over to, uh, we're on the wrong one. Okay. So what we do to create a flow graph is you pop open a GNU Radio Companion and you have this huge list of blocks over here, or a uh, list of categories. And so GNU Radio is full of these, uh, a huge number of these blocks. Um, and so each category will have, and so what we, we're gonna wanna do is like look at, uh, uh, what? Oh, I was probably tar I was looking for our waveform generators, but that's far below. Uh, so let's look at modulators. You open up and so you can see in our modulation section we have a bunch of different modulators uh, modulators and demodulators for FM and AM well FM for uh, like analog stuff we have a lot of digital modulation demodulation a lot of blocks in here uh, what's nice though is you can always just search so you know control F pops up a search box and we can say I want a vector source so you can kind of you know almost not really regex but you can search for anything that has vector in it all right so we need to create a source. We need to somehow put data into our flow graph. And this is gonna be in simulation. Actually, this isn't simulation because it has real hardware attached to it. Uh, but we have this uh, source so that's gonna generate data into the flow graph and we're gonna process it somehow. 
uh, to study this, to study this effect, all I've done is I've put an audio sync so we can hear it. Unfortunately, I don't like, we'll see how, how much we can hear it uh, in this, I'll turn up my volume just in case. Uh, and then we're gonna actually view it in time. And this is a really, I think, important thing for the study of signals and the study of, of radio is the ability to look at signals. So we drop down a time sink. So data starts over there and just flows down the flow graph until it, uh, it, it goes into that sink. Now what's inside of this, if we just double click, I have to keep my mouse focused. We get to put in a bunch of different parameters. So we get, we get to set the data type. So right now we're just gonna work off of uh, floating point numbers. Uh, often you'll see complex numbers used in GNU Radio. We spend most of our time doing complex math, uh, math work, and so complex numbers. Here we're simplifying it by just looking at a, a real number uh, or floating point number. Now the trick here, uh, no, there's also a, a repeat. So we're gonna send out a vector, so we're gonna generate a vector and pass it into the flow graph, but we're gonna repeat that vector over and over again. So this thing is gonna be constantly repeating itself. And what the value that's gonna go into here is based on this con uh, parameter. So it's a variable. And that's one of the things to, to note here, everything that goes in here is actually Python code. So you can do a lot of programmatic stuff directly in, the, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, view here. So con is a variable that I'm gonna set up and uh, manipulate specifically for this purpose of studying this sharp rise time. The fact that we're gonna go from nothing to, to connection. We're gonna do that by having another GUI interaction, uh, interactive tool uh, called enable, oh, sorry, that's, uh, this is actually unnecessary, so we'll disable that. That was for another study. Con is this variable here for a QT GUI checkbox. So it's just, you know, it's a GUI element, a checkbox, so we're gonna check it to turn it on. Uh, so if it's, if it's checked, it's gonna produce a value of one, and if it's not checked, it'll produce a value of zero. And that's going to update that value in the vector source. So the vector source is now either gonna be producing zeros or it's gonna be producing ones. Pretty simple, uh, conceptually but I, I just wanted to make sure that we understood how we can kind of use variables in these parameters to, uh, uh, to go back and forth. So now I'm gonna execute this flow graph. Now, you can't actually see it in this screen, but there's a tool, there's a bunch of toolbars up top, or you hit F6 and it executes the flow graph. So this is our time sync. So data is being generated. This is constantly updating the, the data generation uh, and printing it to, uh, to the time sync. So we're just seeing this. So over along here is the uh, time axis and here's the amplitude axis. Uh, axes. Um, oh no, this is on purpose, yeah, it's, 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 it's scale uh, offset on purpose. Uh, but then I'm going to, so it's just generating zeros, and as I hit the connection here, now I've actually captured that. So if I, if I turn something off here, this is another thing that I wanted to point out here, there's a lot of interactive tools that we can use. So what I've set up here is a trigger to trigger like a O-scope trigger, a normal trigger. And so if, when the signal uh, rises, goes from zero and rises, that triggers the scope to, to, to take a capture and hold that capture. Um, so, but if I turn that off, if I just go to free run, now it's just constantly free running because there's no change in state. So it just, it doesn't care. So we can turn it on, turn it off, back on again. Uh, and also when that's happening, listen to, if you can hear it, you just hear this little click, right? That's this, concept, this kind of extra current concept. Uh, so we can have this kind of interactive uh, study to, to see it, to play with it. I'll turn the trigger back on here. Because again, what we're studying, there we go. What we're studying is this phenomenon that happens from going from zero to a signal very, very fast. In this case, almost instantaneously fast. Now it's a sampled signal. So from one sample, we're at zero, the next sample, so it's not, an, it's not infinitely small, but it's, it's as small as we can get uh, in time in this sampled uh, signal. Um, so what was causing this? That's kind of the question that, uh, that people were asking. And how do we use this to our advantage? What kind of things can we learn from this? So I'll stop this for a second. Go back here. So as I said, Alexander Graham Bell kind of discovered the fact that we can transmit bandwidth over wires. So there was this idea that, that you could have multiple tones going at one time. How do we study this? Possibly one, I mean, it's one of the most important principles in uh, electrical engineering today is the concept of the Fourier transform. This ability to convert a time signal into the frequency domain representation of it. 
So now he worked on a completely different field, actually, but it's been applied to electromagnetic waves uh, pretty much ever since. So what we're doing is we're going to take this time signal, this very short duration time signal, this rise time, and we're going to try to study it from a frequency perspective. And that's something that they didn't quite understand in the, uh, the late 19th century, uh, was, this, uh, uh, was being able to use this property here. But we know how to use it. So let's, let's make use of our tools here, because this is another, as I said, the ability to look at signals and look at them in multiple domains is a really important uh, uh, thing when studying, uh, when studying signals and radio. So we'll drop back into our new radio system here, go into the next flow graph, which is just slightly more complicated, doing a little bit more processing, uh, and added a different sync. So now instead of just looking at it in time, we're going to look at it in time and frequency. And that frequency sync is actually performing the Fourier transform. So we take that time signal and represent it in frequency. Um, really powerful from an analysis point of view. Um, it's also pretty much the way that uh, used, uh, this Fourier transform is used in pretty much every cell phone being sold today. LTE is fundamentally based off of uh, the Fourier transform. Uh, so like I said, uh, massively incredible uh, uh, piece of mathematics that goes into this. The other thing that I'm doing, and this is kind of just for, just to show uh, one property of signal processing, is I've also dumped in a, a, a FIR filter, a finite impulse response filter. Filtering is, again, another incredibly important concept uh, or, or uh, a tool in our signal processing capabilities. Not only is it a great tool, it's also a great form, a way to study systems because pretty much everything is a filter. You put a signal through something, that's that something, that hardware, whatever it is, is going to filter it because it has a band pass response. It can't just pass every single frequency component from here to, to gamma rays. It's going to have some kind of a shape to it, possibly not even a, a, a flat, but sometimes an uneven shape to it. Um, this is what audio people get really obses obsessed about when the, with the response of the speaker system or the microphone, is getting the filter shape as smooth as possible. So we're going to throw in a filter here because we have to band limit the signal. We want the signal to be band limited. So now when I put that up there, uh, and again, don't, don't worry too much about the details of the, I'll show you some filter design tools at the end. Uh, but again, you know, you can study how we do this. But this is just going to be a low pass filter. So now we're going to look at this signal, this, the same concept I'm triggering off of this, uh, this rise time connection here. And now when I do make the connection, um, <coughs> first off, notice that instead of being an uh, instantaneous in, uh, rise, the filter gives us a little bit of a, a, a delayed response uh, and a shape to that. So this is, again, if you've ever looked at signals on an oscilloscope, you've probably seen that phenomenon, uh, very uh, quite, quite popular or famous, well known. But also at the same time, not only are we looking at this in time, but we're also being, uh, now able to look at this in frequency. So this is the frequency domain representation of that signal. And what is that signal? Well, there's the transition period itself. So it's not just a, a one, but there's a lot of ones. It's just a signal that's just on, has no frequency component in that always on state. It's a DC term, right? It's five volts or one volt or whatever we want to call it. Uh, so that's why we have this really large spike at the DC term of the, of the frequency domain. And again, unfortunately, the, the screen is weird here. Uh, all these plots are going to show you positive and negative frequency. So this is minus uh, negative frequency over here. Right in the center here is the DC term. So this is zero, uh, zero hertz. So a huge uh, DC term because we just turned on a DC uh, signal. Uh, so that's what we see here. But again, the important concept here is short time in, or short uh, amount of time, long frequency response. So what this signal has also, or this uh, GUI has also done, is captured the max hold. So I can turn on the max hold and see, because it's a very little amount of energy happening very quick uh, over a period of time. So very well, a lot of energy, very little uh, power because it's it's happening over a short uh, period of time. So this curve here is kind of the, uh, the Fourier transform over a certain number of points that we can see the effect of a very short period of time. So this long response in frequency. And remember, I filtered it. So that filter kind of shows up here at the edges. So it's a very, it's a very loose filter, but it's kind of, you know, it's rolling off there at the edges. So this is the idea that, uh, that these uh, uh, guys had when they were trying to study uh, electromagnetic waves. Okay, if we know these extra currents are producing this long uh, response in, in frequency, 
what if we could capture part of that frequency response? So we know how to generate tones that are very high in frequency because these impulses are very, very broad band. Um, but how do we capture it? So going back to our slides here, that's where we come to uh, another famous mathematician uh, of the 19th century, James Cork Maxwell and the famous Maxwell's equations. And this is where the interesting concept uh, things come into play here. A lot of the people at the time, the scientists at the time, again, didn't understand this time bandwidth, the Fourier transform relationship that we were able to just look at. So he comes up with his theory uh, and mathematics behind the theory of Faraday's induction. So the idea of inducing a current in a system, so the change in bandwidth over, uh, sorry, change in, uh, in uh, the magnetic field over time in this equation is related to the generation of the electric field out of it. So it's not that you just put a magnet in front of something and you get a current. It's the change in the magnet that induces a current uh, somewhere. So this concept of time, uh, change in time, is of course directly related to frequency. So the Maxwellians, the people who believed Maxwell's equations, uh, who understood the math, understood this concept that this rise, high rise in, in uh, uh, short time period rise time based on the equations is going to produce a high frequency response. You know, they had this, uh, they already had this understood. Their question was, how do we actually study this? Now, for the sake of time, I love this, uh, this experiment, but I'm gonna, for the sake of time, I'm gonna try to shorten my, uh, my discussion of it. Uh, this is a Leiden jar. Now, a Leiden jar, it's a specific design, but what we would know it today as is a capacitor. So I'm able to charge this capacitor up with a static electric charge, and then, so I can build up, you know, thousands and thousands of volts on this thing and discharge it. And so it's a spark, it's a static shock. Uh, it's just a large static shock, depending on how much you uh, charge this up. And um, when you're playing with this, it starts to hurt after a while. Uh, so you come up with other ways of <laughs> doing it. But this is an old 19th century tr uh, tool that the scientists used to study electromagnetic fields uh, and electricity in general, static electricity in general. So I bought, or, uh, I, this was a present uh, last year. And so I played with that and I wanted to see, okay, what, what does this impulse look like? You know, I talk about this, I, I, I know this impulse and this math and all this stuff, but what if I actually was able to capture this and see what this, the signal looked like? So I charge this up and then I use this thing, this, this is a B210, this is the US, uh, USRP, one of the hardware uh, systems from Edis Research that we use. In fact, we've got a, a B200 sitting right here um, that we use in GNU radio uh, to, to do signals. Uh, so we can receive with it, we can transmit with it. So in this case, I'm using this 19th century tool uh, to generate a tone and a 21st century tool to receive and capture that tone. So that was really fun. Now, what I'll just point out here is, without going into the details of why, um, this is perfect. I mean, this was so amazingly perfect that I was surprised that it looked as good as it did when I captured. This is a real live capture, and that is a filtered impulse response. I mean, it was, it's actually like, when you, I did a lot of time uh, studying ultra wideband uh, back in, uh, my, in grad school. So this is, this is uh, uh, mathematically very significant to me. But this is the thing that they were able to do back in the day is, is generate these very sharp impulses. And again, knowing Maxwell's equations, we understand that they have this long bandwidth uh, response time. So this is actually only captured at two megahertz, only because I didn't feel like filling up my entire disk uh, with like a 32 mega sample, you know, 32 megahertz of, uh, at a time, which would have given me a really sh uh, an even sharper pulse. So I wanted to, uh, so this is kind of an inspiration for uh, for studying the, the kind of the follow-on effects. And uh, Oliver Lodge, uh, who is one of the, 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 the highest or most well-known of the Maxwellians, uh, I love this quote of his that, uh, and this is really important, I think, again, back to the ability to use our tools to visualize signals. So the, uh, it's ridiculously easy, right? Remember I said, you just plug something in and that's generating high frequency. So they knew that it was ridiculously easy to generate it but he had absolutely no idea how to actually, how to receive it, how to prove that it was being generated. Uh, but so that's where we're, we're gonna try to head to in a second. Now remember I said everything is band limited. Everything is a filter. Like almost like in, you know, without, without uh, uh, too many uh, things that I can think of off the head, everything in the world is basically a filter. So we're gonna use this. We're gonna play with this uh, filtering concept. Uh, and this, this generation here, this flow graph, 
called impulse generator uh, is, okay, let's take this Leiden jar experiment and try to recreate it. Let's simulate this, uh, this experiment. So again, fairly easy to be able to generate an impulse because it's just a series of zeros and then a very, you know, a one. So again, discrete time sampling here. So we just generate a one and then a bunch of zeros. Uh, we just kind of re we'll repeat that so we can see this, uh, this phenomenon over and over again. So we're going to generate that by uh, using this form of the, for the vector source. So 511 zeros followed by a 1 followed by 512 zeros. So a 1024 point vector that's just going to get repeated over and over again. Uh, and again, just remember like th that's Python. That's a Python expression basically to, to concatenate a list. But our receiver, our, our systems all have noise. So I wanted to simulate the noise. So I'm using this, uh, this fast noise generator, and I just kind of approximated the amplitude to get it to look pretty similar. Uh, and it's Gaussian, so it's a Gaussian noise source, a random generation of Gaussian variables. So that's where we come up with the term additive white Gaussian noise. So we're gonna take Gaussian noise, that's pretty much white over the frequency, our, our bandwidth, and just add it to the signal. We come in with a bunch of ones and we just and zeros and we just we just uh, uh, add some noise to it. Now here, this is a uh, some a, a detail here uh, called the throttle. Um, I didn't have it in the, the last flow graphs because I had an audio sync hooked up. That audio sync has a sample rate, and we have to understand sample rates if we're going to do anything with digital signal processing. So the sample rate of the audio card was I, I think it was like 32 kilohertz or something like that is, is how I programmed it. Uh, so that was actually clocking the system, because that audio system can only push data out at such a rate based on its 32 kilohertz clock. So GNU Radio is going to push data to it until its buffer gets filled up, and then GNU Radio is going to hold back. And then as soon as that buffer clears up, we can push more data into it. Here, I, this is pure simulation. I'm just generating samples as fast as my computer can generate them, and I'm just going to display them in time and frequency. I've got nothing gating me. So if I just launch this without something that, that's kind of holding the system back, uh, it's going to go really, really fast. Um, and if you have uh, too much in your flow graph, if you're trying to do too much, uh, it will try to, it will eat as many resources uh, and, and CPU cycles as it can get from your computer. So the throttle is an arbitrary way to hold this back to kind of smooth out and, and slow things down. Uh, it's a very bad throttle. I mean, it's a very bad gating system. It just uses the system clock, uh, which is, you know, not, not accurate to more than like you know, milliseconds, if that. So it's two meg so I'm, I'm sitting here at two mega samples per second, plus or minus the reality of the actual clock. But again, we're just using this for simulation. As soon as you put hardware in the loop, as soon as we had the audio system there, or a radio, get rid of the throttle, because now the throttle is acting as a competing clock. And so you have this thing called the two clock problem uh, that comes up, with two guys are trying to independently uh, um, a sample your system, and because that's a bad one, it's going to perturb your, your ability to, uh, to actually receive or, or transmit properly. So this is pure simulation here. I start this, oh, and, and the filter, instead of doing a, uh, a low-pass filter, I've actually started, I'm using here a uh, Gaussian-shaped filter. The reason why I did this is because I wanted to have, I wanted to narrow, uh, narrow the signal a little bit so that we can study our, uh, our receiver in a second. Um, but also, as I said, I studied a lot of ultra-wideband, um, uh, pulse-generated ultra-wideband, where we were doing four gigahertz wide pulses. Um, but it was generated by a Gaussian monocycle. So Gaussian and monocycle in time, take the, in, uh, the integral of that, the Fourier transform, it's a Gaussian in frequency as well. Uh, and hopefully that's the most math I'll get into uh, today. So I just wanted the Gaussian filter because it, it just looks nice and it's going to fit the, uh, it fits the story. But here we have the impulse going up there. Uh, like I said, like every 500 or every 1024 samples, we have this one, and then it's getting uh, distorted by some noise, and then filtered by this Gaussian filter response. So this is uh, this is my my way of playing with this idea of uh, impulse generation. Let's see. Is there anything else? I'll point this out again. I'll go over a, uh, a, a, an easy way to look at uh, filter generation uh, in a few minutes, uh, but we're using a tool here to just generate a Gaussian filter. Um, I think that's pretty much all we want to learn from this, uh, this flow graph.
Okay. So, uh, in this case, I'm, I'm uh, experimenting like it's a 200 megahertz signal uh, spectrum uh, signal. Filtering with that Gaussian filter, and now the trick is to be able to sample this. How do we actually get this, uh, this signal back? And that's where this guy comes in, and that's, he was really the motivation for this talk, is to study how did Hertz do his work? What was the original uh, uh, experiments that Hertz did, and how can we use them to, to study uh, software radio? Um, and then in, in researching this, reading a lot of books, this is the quote of Hertz that I just love the most. Somebody after his first lecture at Karlsruhe, uh, this is Karlsruhe University at the time, uh, he demonstrates that he's able to do these electromagnetic fields, and somebody says, that's amazing, you've, you know, basically you've proven Maxwell right, you know, everything works as predicted, what good is this? And his response was, well, nothing, I guess. So <laughs> maybe one of the most fundamental or important, uh, commercially for sure, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, discoveries in, in history. I mean, you think of the billion dollar cell phone industry, kind of goes back to uh, this thing which was eh, just a lark, uh, just for fun. So. What did he do? How did he do, what did he do that Lodge didn't understand? Because Lodge, as he said, didn't have any clue as how to, how to actually capture that signal being generated. And that's where, uh, that's what this apparatus does. So it's a spark gap transmitter. So you got this, uh, this transformer here generating a high voltage and then there's a spark gap that gets uh, generated at approximately 100 million uh, times per second. So roughly uh, um, sitting at a carrier frequency of 100 megahertz, you generate this spark around there, uh, and so 100 million times a second, you get this very broadband signal being generated. That signal is then transmitted over this dipole-like uh, antenna structure. Um, it was just two kind of loads that he had to that kind of approximated an antenna. It was kind of like an, uh, an early form of an antenna. Um, but that's why I wanted to filter the signal, because this is a filter, right? I mean, even though this is generating a broadband signal, the response, the, the electromagnetic properties of this load system here, this antenna, is going to have a filtered response. So in, in, a, in a way, when you're studying antennas, you can study them in terms of filters and how they behave in frequency, what kind of shape they're gonna perform in frequency. Uh, and so it's very, actually, it's very difficult to make broadband uh, antennas because they all have a shape to them. Um, we figured out how to do it now pretty well, but it's, it's still not, not easy, a dipole, tends to be very, very structured around, uh, around a certain wavelength of, uh, of the signal. So we're generating this filtered signal, and all his receiver was doing is just this large loop here, and you can see, you know, when the signal, when, they, when he matched these, basically he's doing matching of filters. So in another word, he's doing impedance matching. So once he could, could figure out what the impedance matching was, generates a signal here, you get a spark between those two, uh, those, those two balls at the end of the, the antenna. So for all this work of trying to, f to trying to receive signals, how do we look at signals, how do we know that we're doing it, the entire receiver is fairly trivial. Except that he had to do it the right way. So here we're going to get into a little bit more interesting GNU radio flow graph, where we're going to try to not only generate that impulse, but what do we do to receive it? And we're going to receive it by uh, uh, um, uh, approximating this antenna as a filter in our flow graph. So also one thing to point out, Instead of having all these uh, orange ports here, so these are the ports that we connect, um, I've now switched them, and, and so just so you know, you, uh, to connect up blocks, you just kind of hit one port, connect to the other port, and it creates this connection. The blue now, we're now dealing in complex numbers um, because I wanted to do a complex bandpass filter. Uh, don't worry too much about that if, you're, if, if you don't want to go into uh, to complex uh, numbers. Uh, I just wanted to point out why the, the change from the color. Uh, so. Uh, Visually, you'll see what's happening without having to really understand why. Uh, I can certainly answer the question if anybody wants, but uh, we'll just go from, uh, uh, from here. So that top section there is very similar to what we had in the previous uh, uh, example, except now it's complex. So I'm generating complex uh, a, a, an impulse, adding some noise to it, putting that Gaussian filter on it. So that's our transmitted signal. This filter is our receiver. And so I'm generating these receive taps so notice here, I just put in this variable, Rx taps, uh, which I'm defining up here. And if I can expand this, we can see a little bit about what's going on here. There we go. 
So I'm using, again, our filter design capabilities in GNU Radio, We're using this API call uh, into the, the library, and I'm passing in a bunch of parameters. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna create this receiver, so I'm gonna have this filter, uh, like com this band pass filter, uh, with these different parameters being set. Now the bandwidth in the transition bands that I've got set here are variables that I've defined elsewhere. And apparently not, oh. Uh, so I define these as, as, uh, as static values. So I've got, a, I've got a bandwidth, so the antenna itself is gonna have this certain bandwidth based on this number here. Uh, transition band, again, if you're not familiar with filter terminology, it's just how the shape, just how the roll off of the filter looks. But the important uh, uh, useful tool is this uh, range block. So again, we remember we had that connection, that the checkbox to turn something on and off. This is now a slider. So we can put down a slider onto our, uh, our application and don't, don't worry too much about trying to parse what that is. I'm just giving it a range, just so we can go, we can just slide this range uh, uh, around our frequency domain. And that's gonna update the filter as the system is running so that we're gonna basically be tuning our antenna, like a live tuning of the antenna to be able to see the signal. So when I run this, uh, let's see, I'm gonna turn off the imaginary parts so we're just gonna be able to look at a real signal here. So that blue signal on the top there is the, uh, the transmitted signal. That's what we're trying to capture, but we're just gonna look at it so we, we can see what we're trying to capture. The green is our receiver. So this was the difficulty was uh, I mistuned. My antenna is now is, is not tuned to the right frequency response, uh, so I'm getting very little uh, signal coming through here. And we can see this in the frequency domain. Uh, this blue signal is the transmitted signal, and the red is after going through our receiver filter, our mistuned receiver filter. So, first of all, notice, you know, yes, we're seeing signal here because no filter is perfect. There's always energy leaking uh, through our filters, but this is in decibels, like decibels relative to a one floating point number. It's, so, think of it as a DBM if you're uh, if you're into. Um, uh, like amateur radio guys here will we'll easily understand uh, uh, DBM, but it's a log scale. So we're going from minus like 45 down to minus like 120. In log scale, that's a huge decrease in power. So we can see the power from the, the transmitter up in the blue, and even though there is power coming through here, uh, it's, it's not really showing up in the time because it, it really is suppressed so much in, uh, in power. But there's this little guy sitting over here, and that's my filter. That's my bandpass filter that I've created, but I've started it detuned down here. But yeah, so I've got this center frequency slider here, and I'll just use the, uh, the buttons here to, uh, so I can move the center frequency of that filter. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm recreating the filter taps uh, to generate a new filter response. So, ah, come on. So as I, as I change it, as I, as I increase the, uh, the filter uh, center frequency, you can see how the, can I keep this? Uh, there we go. Uh, you can see how the response of the uh, incoming signal is now changing. So now more energy is coming into our, uh, our receiver. And notice the green there is starting to come back up as we're getting more and more of the energy. In the, so if I can perfectly tune uh, close to it, yeah, close enough. If I can perfectly tune my receiver antenna, if I can create the loop, essentially the diameter of that, that antenna is gonna be its frequency response, I can place this, my receiver, in the center of the transmitted signal and capture as much energy as I possibly can. So notice how the filtered, the receiver has a smaller bandwidth than the transmitter. Um, so I'm just trying to center it so that I get as much of that, that energy as possible. And so notice two things. The green line is slightly smaller than the blue line. We have some loss, uh, energy loss, and it's also delayed in time. That's because it's a filter. It has a, there's a time delay. There's a group delay that a filter has. It takes a little bit of time for the signal to pass through that filter. Um, just again, actually the same as, uh, as an antenna. So here we have the ability to, uh, to tune our system uh, while it's running and play with this idea to, to, to see how we can capture this impulse response. Um, okay, and I think that's the, uh, that's the last that we'll, we need to learn from that. Um, 
Yeah, this just goes over what I basically what I said about tuning and mistuning our, our signal. Uh, all right, this is just for us later. So, uh, just got about five minutes. Um, so I just want to pop this up really fast then. Uh, to again, we did a lot of, of work here. I, you know, I showed you a lot of things that had filters being generated. So, and again, filters are, are hugely important when you're trying to do any kind of signal processing. And there's a few kind of gotchas that we need to, to be able to play with. Um, I can't see that, let's see. So if we are able to see the toolbar, again, I don't know why the resolution is doing this, but there's a tools menu bar and there's a filter design tool that GNU Radio has, but I'm just gonna launch it from, uh, from my desktop here. So we would, there we go. So what we can do here is play with and design our filters and we can, we can study the filters in different ways with this tool uh, so that we understand kind of what the, the consequences of our filters are. So uh, not going into the details, fur filter, you know, Hamming window versus Blackman window, things like that. Let's just look at it from a low pass filter perspective. So we're gonna low pass. So the pass band of this filter, we're gonna pass all frequencies up to 50,000 kilohertz. And then we're gonna attenuate that signal afterwards. But we're gonna tell the filter that you have 10 kilohertz to stop the, the pass band and then slowly de degrade uh, into uh, into the noise floor. Go down here and hit the design, and there's our filter. So that's what that filter looks like. Passes everything, it's, this is the frequency response. So think of it as multiplying your frequencies together. So anything being multiplied in the pass band is being multiplied by a one. And then as we go into the transition band down to the stop band, we're multiplying by a very low number in, in decibels. So we're suppressing this, uh, this signal uh, dramatically. Something to keep in mind here when you're playing with these filters, and again, this is a, it's a very common uh, um, uh, misunderstanding from people just getting into signal processing or just getting into radios, is the consequence of your filter. So in this case, the consequence of the filter is that I have to, uh, that the number of taps of this filter is 59. So I have to do 59 multiplies and adds to, to uh, compute the filter. So the longer your filter, the the, the, the heavier its compute power is going to be. Um, and we want to we want to minimize that. So how do we minimize the number of uh, taps? Well, there's two things. Uh, we have kind of two degrees of freedom here, and I'll, I'll only play with one for today. But if I go from 60K, so I, I gave myself 10K to go from a one to zero. Uh, so now if I do 70, so I have 20K, I've now relaxed my filter from a signal processing perspective. But now if I design this one, I went from 59 taps down to 29 taps. So now I have to do 30 fewer multiply and add computations uh, to run this filter. But notice that it's, it's, it takes a longer bit of time. So it's a sloppier filter, which can be okay, right? That's the thing that, that I, I, a lot of people that come to us with problems. Why doesn't my flow graph work? It's taking too, you know, it's, it's taking too many computations. And it's because a lot of people have done something like this. Um, I do 51. Uh, 581 taps. But that's a really nice filter, isn't it? Right? I'm not getting any other signal in. But people don't, you know, you, you have to study, you have to understand the response of the entire signal and the system that you're working with because it can be okay to have a long transition band. What that's going to do is it's going to pull in extra energy, maybe a little bit of extra noise, um, and maybe a little bit of interference. But you have to be able to, to, to uh, balance these ideas of the cost of the computation versus the cost from a single processing perspective. And this is the, and that's why I point out this tool because I wanna make sure that, you know, um, knowing that it exists, you can uh, use it to study your filters. Let's go back to a, a cheaper filter and notice that like we can go over here, we can actually see the taps. So I, we look at it from the frequency domain and now we're moving into the uh, time domain here. You can look at the phase response and the group delay, um, which is, let's look at the phase response here. Uh, the delay of the filter, 29 tap filter, 27 tap filter, is gonna have a delay based on the number of taps because you're kind of moving through these taps one at a time. Uh, so it's gonna delay that signal out. So 27 taps, obviously, a much shorter delay than 581 taps. So again, that's another trade-off that we need to be, uh, be aware of uh, is the delay that's gonna be produced in our system. Uh, and so there's plenty of, uh, of, of other things to play around with from a, if this were a filter lecture, to spend a lot more time uh, in there. 
But uh, I think this is a really useful tool uh, to, to play with, to, to learn about filters, but also when you're, when you're actually designing a system and you actually want to design your filter, I go to this all the time. And there is actually a way to save this filter. I just, uh, you know, you just go up to file, save, and it exports it as a CSV file. It could be more clever, but everything reads CSV. There's not that much uh, data to capture here. Um, but so you can save it, uh, your favorite filter that you've designed here, and, uh, and, and pull it up later. Um, all of the design methods that are being used in this tool are also programmatically available in GNU Radio itself. So I, you know, I pulled that up and I showed you furdes.gaussian. So that's basically if I change this, uh, where's my mouse? There we go, somewhere up there. So I could actually create that Gaussian filter here and look at the magnitude response. So there's a Gaussian filter. So this is just a graphical interface on top of our, uh, our calls, our function calls within GNU Radio. Um, so yeah, you can do a lot of, uh, of, of, of playing around from that perspective. Okay. Uh, so there's just a little bit of that. Um, okay. Yeah. All right, I'm running right up against time here. So I'm just going to, uh, there's, there's a, some slides at the back here, just to point them out. Um, kind of talking more about the project itself, that there's, you know, this community and this, this uh, a whole bunch of these out-of-tree projects, so people building projects against GNU Radio, trying to show you the, the, the list of possible block categories that we have available. So it's a massive list of available algorithms in GNU Radio already, plus this entire ecosystem, this entire community of developers who are building their own sets of tools and blocks and algorithms. We tend to be generic, try to be generic inside GNU Radio. So very general stuff, filters, adders, multipliers, uh, synchronous, you know, uh, um, things that can be used against many, many signals. Uh, the auditory projects tend to be focused on particular signals, uh, LTE, Bluetooth, ADSB, uh, AIS, those types of signals. Uh, so we try not to get very particular inside of GNU Radio. Um, but I just wanted to point that out. Before going back to the final demo part, um, because I wanted to make sure that, that we understood everything I was doing up here was in simulation. Uh, well, there was the audio portion of it. Um, but as I said, we also have this ability to connect to hardware. So we have these hardware tools like the USERPs uh, and other uh, devices, the HackRF, the RTL SDR dongles, uh, that we can connect into it. So we can go from our generation of signals here, and here I'm generating two signals at uh, different frequencies. And I just wanted to do sine waves because, well, we were, you know, this talk was inspired by Hertz, and we, that's the unit that we use to, uh, to measure sine waves uh, and frequency is the Hertz. So I'm multiplying, in, or, yeah, multiplying two signals together, just going to create a weird signal that I'm going to transmit uh, over the air. So I'm going to, uh, I've put down this block here, this usurp sync, so I can be able to transmit it over the air. So as I run this, it's going to take a little bit of time to, uh, to, to load. And so this guy is now transmitting at 428 megahertz, a fairly small amount of energy. Um, I'm going to increase it just enough. So I'm just transmitting, generating a little bit of a sine wave here. Oh yeah, the B200 actually, you need to kind of give it a lot of gain. There we go. So I'm generating the signal here, and I have GNU Radio now running on Android, where I'm pulling the signal in through, uh, <laughs> So I just have the RTL SDR dongle uh, connected through to GNU Radio, and this is actually filtering the signal. I'm just using a filter because I wanted to do something more than just, you know, uh, receiving and, and displaying. Uh, but yeah, so that's that signal being transmitted from there. Um, so this is our kind of our new project right now is to get this uh, a little bit more stable and ready to, to ship out the door. So we'll be seeing a lot more of these tools soon. Okay. Um, do we have time for questions? I'm, I'm a, like a couple minutes over, so. Uh, oh, really? I thought I was done at, uh, at 10. Okay, so. Um, well, I'm done at 10.15, but, but let's make time for a transition. So let's, uh, let me turn this off. And let me just pop up, let's see. Yeah, let me just pop that up. And uh, so I guess, yeah, are there any questions?
uh, well, s the bandwidth of the signal, so the spark gap, are you talking about the, like the Hertz experiment itself? Uh, I actually don't know. I don't know if we know what the, the bandwidth of it is. Um, like I said, he was generating the spark at, at 100 million times per second. And because it's a spark, because you know, it's, a, it's this instantaneous spark, as my, my Leiden jar experiment showed, it does have a very broad uh, frequency response. But then it's being generated, passed through this antenna structure, these loads that he had. So it's, I think the bandwidth is going to depend mostly on the load of that, that structure. So we'd have to study what the material was, the size of those loads, all that. I'm sure we could kind of roughly calculate it if we went back and saw his original uh, experimenters. Even even Hertz's experiment was a few gigahertz. Okay, so so f yeah, broad bands. Precisely, yeah. So yeah, exactly. Precisely, yeah. So yes. I don't know. Um, so the thing is, so so one of the the interesting points was I showed in time what that looked like. I can't show you the frequency response. The power, because it's so quick in time, the amount of power being generated is so small. There may be a lot of energy, but it's energy, you know, well, no, there's actually very little energy as well, energy over time being power. So very, very little power being generated. So probably because most regulators only care if, you're ri if you rise above. If I was generating this continuously, that's a problem. <laughs> but just once every, like, few minutes, you know, nobody's going to see it. That's right. Uh, uh, it's, so the problem with the generation of wideband signals in software radio is still like, you still have to have specialized equipment, you know, high-speed FPGAs. Doing things over USB, you're not going to get that kind of bandwidth. Um, so you can experiment with OFDM. You can experiment with CDMA, which was a competing standard. The pulse generation for like real, true ultra-widebands, that's not happening in these types of systems. They're, they're just not designed for it. Uh, the hardware for a pulse generated uh, uh, ultra wideband is very, very specific and, and kind of highly tuned. So. <laughs> ultra wideband was huge about 10 years ago, and we just we never really figured out the right application. And, and the, the, you know, not only, cr not only being able to do it, but also being able to do it in a commercially viable way where receivers and transmitters, we just, ne yeah, nobody really got there or needed it until, you know, so maybe in 10 years it'll come back in fashion. Going out.